today actually happens to be the 70th anniversary of an event. Uh, 70 years ago this morning, a, uh, an artist, P.I. Medvedev, sat down uh, at his window to do a landscape painting and heard a big boom and saw something fly across the sky. And so it ended up that it turned out to be a meteorite. Uh, we now know it as Sukkot Aline. It's about uh, 270 miles north, north, uh, east of uh, Vladivostok in Russia. And uh, there's a, a lot of it around. And I have a, a sample here, uh, right over here. And again, after the talk, uh, you can come and take a look at it. So, we're going to do a lot of the language of meteoritics. Uh, the weather people got meteorology taken, so we have to call this meteoritics. So we have a meteoroid, which is a small solar system body. A meteor, which is a meteoroid that enters Earth's atmosphere and glows due to frictional heating. And a meteorite is a meteoroid, or a meteor, that survives its trip through the atmosphere and ends up being found by somebody. Or in the case of opportunity on Mars. And there's also such a thing as an impact type, which is not a meteor or meteorite, but related to it. And it is earth rock that has been modified due to an impact. I have one of those up here as well. A lot of definitions. So a fall is one or more meteorites that are discovered as a result of a witnessed or a documented impact event. A find is one or more that is discovered without <coughs> benefit of being seen to fall. And uh, most meteorites are named for the closest uh, location feature or other geographical entity where they were found. Uh, and you can read uh, Kyrillic, that would be Chelyabinsk, which uh, was a famous one that happened four years ago in Russia. Uh, four years ago, Tuesday. Now, if multiple unrelated meteorites are found in the same locale, then it typically will be done for the as far as naming is to put a letter in parentheses or a number following the location name. And the number can contain the year if it happens to be an Antarctic or some uh, Sahara meteorites, because there are just so many. So some history. Uh, they've been found in uh, Egypt, dating to about 3300 BC, <coughs> iron beads <coughs> made of meteoritic material, and uh, there is an iron dagger blade from the tomb of Tutankhamun, and uh, Inuit also used hammered pieces of the Cape York meteorite for lanceheads. Now, Diogenes of Apollonia was the uh, philosopher who first uh, is considered the first to suggest that meteorites come from beyond the Earth. Now, that's not the same guy who went with a, a lantern looking for an honest man. It's a different Diogenes. So the first accurately dated fall was on November 7th, 1492 near Ensisheim, Alsace, France. And in 1794, uh, scientist Ernst Stadley published a scientific treatise. He actually did a literature search to propose an extraterrestrial or origin for meteorites. And in 1802, uh, chemist Edward Howard 
uh, discovered that iron meteorites contained certain alloys that just weren't found in earth deposits, and stony meteorites contained not only iron but nickel. Again, something that would have been rare on earth. So, we have the concept of what's called a strewn field. And when a meteor <coughs> enters the Earth's atmosphere, stresses can build up and they can uh, explode due to that uh, in a sort of air burst, and pieces will fall in an elliptical pattern, and that's uh, called a strewn field. Specimen is just an item of meteoritic or related origin, and a type specimen is the first or uh, most uh, famous, sometimes, uh, meteorite that represents a class or subclass of meteorite. So in 1803, uh, Jean-Baptiste Biot mm -hmm. was sent to investigate a witness fall in Lego, France. And he had with him a previously found uh, a uh, sample from a place called Barbatan, which fell in 1790. He found that these uh, were very similar, but nothing else happened on Earth that would connect them. And so he interviewed a lot of people, uh, many of which were uh, people who had uh, no reason to lie about the event. And so he wrote a very complete and impassioned report to his discoveries and it's his paper that convinced the scientific community that meteorites were really extraterrestrial. So the first recorded uh, fall in the United States occurred in what was then Western Connecticut, now it's Eastern Connecticut, uh, which was formed after the fall, which was December 14th, 1807. I do have a sample of Weston up here. And uh, there's a quote uh, from uh, President Jefferson that's easy to believe that uh, Yankee professors could lie than to believe that stones could fall from heaven. Uh, it turns out that that story was pretty ap apocryphal and that it was kind of made up after the fact. For good, uh, good press, I guess, at the time. Now, let's still talk a bit about classification. And to, just to make things easy, there's multiple classification systems. So there's a classification system by structure or physical appearance, uh, and that turns out to be a bit older of a system and uh, actually a bit easier to figure out. The newer one is based more on chemical analysis, chemical properties, and uh, you can see a kind of little bit of summary up there. And it is, uh, again, based on the chemical properties and it aids in trying to figure out what the originating body may have been to a particular meteorite, since most meteorites uh, do come from asteroids. And just again to make it even more easy, hybrid classification schemes are common. So again, uh, uh, you might find uh, a mixture of the two. So let's talk about the simple classification. And we'll start off with easy stony, iron, and stony iron. Okay, so let's start off with the stony types. And uh, before you get any math anxiety about the calculus or whatever, this really is not that. This is uh, asteroid differentiation. So that uh, when the uh, early solar system uh, bits and pieces of uh, solar material came together and formed uh, planetesimals, asteroids, and uh, planets as we know them. And uh, so the smaller ones uh, started off being undifferentiated, but as they grew, uh, due to uh, various forces, uh, including uh, radioactivity, those uh, uh, bodies heated up and got hot enough to start melting the contents. When the contents melt, then you have the heavier uh, 
elements and components sinking to the center and the lighter uh, floating to the top. And then a uh, impact event happens uh, because the uh, early solar system was a bit like a shooting gallery. Uh, pieces break off and that gives you bits of asteroid that we interact with as meteorites. And so most meteorites are pieces of asteroids and also most are older than any earth rock. The oldest earth rock is about four billion years old and just about all meteorites, even the differentiated ones, are from about 4.3 billion to 4.5 billion years old or thereabouts. Here's another diagram of differentiation which uh, also uh, associates various meteorite types to various asteroid types. So let's just talk about stony. We'll start with silicates. And a silicate is any mineral consisting of tetrahedral anions containing silicon and oxygen in that pyramid or tetrahedral form. And so it's a large family. Pure silicate crystal structure with no joining other materials gives you something like quartz. A very common silicate is olivine, magnesium iron silicate, and it has uh, varying amounts of either magnesium or iron. If it's magnesium rich, it's called forsterite. If it's iron rich, it's called phaolite. And there's a gem quality version of olivine that's called peridot. Another important family of silicates are the pyroxenes. They are chain magnesium iron silicate. And the magnesium side is called enstatite. And the iron rich side is ferrocyolite. And then there are a couple of in-betweens, hypersthene and bronzite. And so those are some of the terms you might see describing some meteorites. Chondrules are some of the first solids to form in the solar system. They end up being spherical inclusions in meteorites. And uh, they are extremely old. Mostly consist of olivine. And they can be encased in some sort of... Uh, what's called feldspathic material, sodium, potassium, or calcium, aluminum, silicate material. <coughs> Stony meteorites that contain chondrules are called chondrites. And uh, uh, there's a little bit of a disclaimer there because uh, not all uh, chondrites do have chondrules. Uh, and so what they've done is they say a chondrite uh, really is a meteorite that more or less mirrors the uh, non-volatile composition of the sun. Other meteorites are called achondrites, and those are the uh, type primarily that uh, have differentiated. And chondrites are the most numerous type of meteorite. Just going to run through the different types of chondrites. With uh, uh, some of them have uh, examples there. So uh, Chergok, which was a fall in uh, Mali, is an ordinary chondrite. You have carbonaceous chondrites such as Allende. Enstatite uh, chondrites, uh, such as AB. Allende, by the way, is in, uh, fell in Mexico in 1969. Uh, AB uh, is uh, from, fell in Canada. And then you have some rarer types, so uh, it's called a rumorudiite. Uh, the uh, type specimen uh, 
was uh, in, from Kenya in a near place called Maruti. And even rarer than that, you have Kakangariites. And there are only, I think, about four of those that are known. Kakangari is a, a fall that occurred in India. So chondrites are grouped besides uh, those higher uh, groups in terms of the uh, metal content. And so ordinary and instatite chondrites have are, group, are cut, categorized as H for high metal, L for low metal, and then for ordinary chondrites there is even a double L, which is for the lowest metal. And then Carbonaceous chondrites have a different scheme, and they are grouped by the initial letter of the associated type specimen, with one exception, because they also have an H for a high number one. And the groups are further subdivided by what's called a petrologic type, to indicate how the chondrules have been modified, uh, changed by temperature and pressure. And again, to run through those, ordinary chondrites, they vary from 3 to 7 based on whether or not the, the heat got to them or not. So 3 means that they haven't changed much, whereas 7 means that they're practically gone from due to the melting due to heat and pressure. Now, in addition, carbonaceous chondrites have three to one that they can vary depending on how much they've been modified by water. Because where the carbonaceous chondrites, uh, chondrules uh, have formed, are out further in the solar system where liquid water can exist. So again, three means that there is no uh, aqueous alteration. Two, Less distinct chondrules, moderate aqueous alteration, and one means the chondrules are practically gone from being washed out. Another thing there are, again, some very early solids in the solar system are called calcium aluminum rich inclusions. And so those are some of the first solids that may have formed in the protoplanetary disk. And the oldest has been dated to over four and a half billion years old. They're usually light colored and irregular in shape, and some uh, chondrites do contain the CAIs. And you can see uh, that's actually an individual that's cut in half, and you can see the large CAI in the middle there. And uh, they've done some studies, and with the modeling of the early <coughs> solar system, they've, uh, uh, some studies suggest that uh, the enstatite chondrites, uh, con uh, the chondrules for the enstatite chondrites formed in this area of the solar system. Whereas we are looking further out now, and we can see the, the current asteroid belt, for the other uh, um, chondrites, uh, ordinary chondrites formed uh, outside the orbit of Mars, chondrules for Rumeruti, chondrites formed a little bit further out, and then the ones for the carbonaceous chondrites formed even further out, almost to where Jupiter is. So those are suggested by some studies. So we talked about stone. Okay, we have uh, metal in meteorites. A lot of it, some, as a matter of fact, in, in many of them. Many of them, including stony, contain metals. And that's why one of the tests for possible meteorites uh, is uh, use of a magnet. Most of the metal is a mixture of iron and nickel, and that's formerly called siderite. 
So iron, <laughs> nickel, and they end up being the most common magnetic elements as well. Now, asteroid differentiation, of course, results in most of the metals accumulating in the core. And that's actually one of the early clues as to the Earth containing a metal core is by the discovery <coughs> of metallic uh, meteorites. So iron and nickel, they can combine to form these alloys, with metallic uh, minerals. Uh, the two really important ones for uh, meteorites are tyanite, which is iron mixed with about 20 to 65 percent nickel, and chemicite, which is iron mixed with about 5 to 12 percent nickel. And under slow cooling conditions, very slow cooling conditions, uh, a few degrees every million years, chemicite can precipitate along the uh, octahedral planes of the tyanite. So the precipitate results in a distinctive Widmanstetten pattern, or Thomson structure, easier to say, when the specimen is sliced, polished, and etched with a weak acid. And the bands or ribbons are called lamellae, and the lamellae patterns are uh, braided from coarsest to finest. There we go. Okay, and uh, there are three types of iron meteorites from the easy uh, or a simple classification. Octahedrites, which actually are the most common. Uh, then you have ataxites and hexahedrites. So, stony iron meteorites, and these are caused by from collisions between uh, asteroids and mixing up the uh, iron from the core of a differentiated one with some of the uh, mantle or rock of a differentiated asteroid. And so there are two main categories of those. Palisites, which are iron meteorites with embedded olivine crystals. And uh, they're named after Peter Pallas not the asteroid Pallas. And Peter Pallas was a uh, biologist, uh, but he was uh, a naturalist who uh, took an interest in these uh, strange mixtures of iron and rock. And uh, they are considered by many to be the most beautiful of meteorites. And uh, mesosiderites are the other type, and they're about half and half, half iron and half rock. <coughs> half stone. So, your structural classification, <coughs> stony, stony irons and irons, and then the stonies are uh, broken up into chondrites and achondrites. Stony irons, palisites, and mesosiderites. And irons are Again, hexahedrites, octahedrites, and ataxites. And those are further, octahedrites are further broken up by those patterns, coarse to fine. Okay, now for the other one. And those uh, divide up meteorites into undifferentiated and differentiated, and then something in between. So the chondrites are undifferentiated, achondrites are differentiated meteorites, and then in between they have something called primitive achondrites, which are sort of partially melted but not fully differentiated. And so chondrites, again, as we've seen, have the ordinary carbonaceous enstatites and rumorudiites and capingariites. And uh, ordinary chondrites are HL and LL for the amount of metal. <coughs> and then the petrologic grades will show up underneath that. There we go. From 3 to 7. And 
so those are the things you will see on the classification of ordinary chondrites. For carbonaceous chondrites, they even have a little more uh, convoluted. They have a, a higher structure called a clan, and that's where they've grouped some of the uh, subgroups uh, into uh, sort of uh, uber groups there. And so the various uh, types of uh, carbonaceous chondrites are listed there, and even some of those are further subdivided. Enstatites are, have just high and low metal, and then those are again subdivided by petrologic type, the amount of change that the chondrites have had. And primitive chondrites, they have clans and different categories there. And as you can see, uh, with uh, these two guys here, uh, some of the irons are included in primitive achondrites. Uh, and that's because they have found that uh, some of those irons have uh, some of these stony types as inclusions within those iron meteorites. And so that means they've come from the same parent bodies. And that's, the again, the rationale for this classification. And achondrites have a bunch of different flavors, too. Uh, and uh, um, the palisites and mesosiderites are here, along with the, uh, most of the irons, as well as Martian and lunar. Because we do have meteorites that have been blasted off the surface of Mars and the moon. And I have uh, two examples of each of those here on the table. And HED are uh, a set of uh, crust and uh, somewhat below the crust uh, meteorites that have, are thought to be from the asteroid 4 Vesta. And so the uh, Howardites are from the, the sort of topmost crust. Uh, Eucrites are somewhat lower than that. And Diogenites uh, seem to have formed a bit uh, below those guys. So those are deemed to be from the asteroid Vesta. Mesosiderites have, um, again, broken up into some various groups. And palisites also are in uh, various groups. The main group is uh, by far the most common. Uh, you have uh, not too many that are in Eagle Station and even fewer in pyroxene palisites. Martian, there's a few of those types too. The uh, most common of Mars are shergatites, which are the two that I have. Uh, rarer than those are noplites and uh, chasignites, and orthopyroxenites are even rarer still. For lunar, three basic types here, uh, and uh, we'll go through a couple of those terms a little bit later, but again, uh, those are different types of lunar achondrites. We were able to uh, characterize them as lunar because from the Apollo program, uh, we know sort of the composition of uh, at least crustal lunar rocks. Iron meteorites, now that is a real uh, virtual can of worms. And what they've done here is characterize them by the percentages of three trace elements, gallium, germanium, and iridium, uh, and their proportions of that to nickel. And they've done a sort of multi-dimensional cluster analysis to come up with a bunch of groups that have uh, uh, the x-axis is divided up in one, two, three, and four. Or is that the y-axis? One of those axes is one, two, three, and four in Roman numerals, and the other is A through G. And so, it's a pretty complicated system. And again, they attempt to try to associate those with particular uh, asteroids. But even with all that, still about 15% of them are ungrouped. And so there you see a good bunch of those guys there. So some <coughs> statistics. And what this shows is that the vast majority of meteorites are stony, even though the iron ones are the easiest to recognize. And so you can see uh, 
all meteorites and then the North American ones to the right of that. Below you see the ones that have been seen to have fallen. Uh, and again, most of those are stony as well. Some more statistics showing the various types. And again, of the chondrites, uh, you can see most of them are ordinary. And within the ordinary, they're split up. Uh, again, H's and L's are pretty evenly divided with the, the lowest metal uh, coming up third. And then you can see carbonaceous and enstatite and where some of those other groups fall in. Okay, some more terminology. So a clast is something you'll see quite often. That's a fragment of stone containing a larger stone specimen. A brescia is a stone that consists mostly of glass. And a regolith is sort of like yeah. the top layer of crust, loose fragmental of material on a planetary or asteroidal surface. Okay, the term monomic means that the glass and a brescia consist of the same kind of stone. And that's as opposed to polymic, which says that the class are different kinds of stone. And a xenolith is a specimen that contains uh, two distinct types of stone, such as that uh, specimen of uh, Gumbara that you see there. And that's a uh, meteorite that was found in Oman. Etched means that an iron or stony iron meteorite has been polished and then a weak acid to it has been applied and that exposes the Goodman-Stetton pattern and that's because the two uh, different uh, alloys of iron nickel, tannite and camisite uh, actually dissolve at different rates in the weak acid and that's what exposes the pattern. <coughs> Crusted means that a meteorite has a fusion crust. And so as it comes blasting through our atmosphere, it heats up and it kind of melts the outer uh, portions of the meteorite. Uh, it can be either full or partial. And one or more layers can start peeling back. And so that's called secondary and or tertiary crust. And uh, related to that, uh, it can also be, a crusted meteorite can be oriented where you can actually see flow lines because the meteorite didn't tumble very much as it came through the atmosphere. And so you can actually see the direction that it kind of came. An individual is a complete meteorite. Fragment is a broken off piece of an individual. A window is what they call it when you have an individual and they slice off a little part of it so that you can uh, see the inside as well as uh, the crust. A full slice is a complete slice of an individual. Part slice is part of a full slice. And of course you can see that in uh, the specimens because uh, they usually are cut pretty straight, and so if you see straight edges on a specimen, chances are very good that that's been cut. An end slice or an end cut is one where one side of the, the, the specimen is the outside of the meteorite. The main mass is the significantly largest specimen of a named meteorite. <clears throat> Total known weight, abbreviated TKW, is the sum of all the weights of all specimens of a named meteorite. And paired is an indication that a meteorite has been, uh, maybe actually a smother specimen of a previously named meteorite. And so they've been given a provisional name, perhaps, and uh, they uh, <coughs> do the studies. They have found that that meteorite is actually the same uh, chemically in every way as another um, specimen that was previously known. Well, 
Weathering is deterioration or other changes due to environmental factors on Earth. A skeleton is a palisite, a stony iron meteorite, where the stone component has weathered away and it leaves just the metal behind. We do have one of those here as well. And caliche, that is a carbonate coating or adhesion to meteorites that's caused by soil and moisture on Earth. <coughs> so, when a meteorite comes, or a meteoroid, uh, meteor, I guess at that point, comes through the atmosphere, uh, the more volatile stuff near the surface can have laid away, and that leaves these thumbprints or depressions, and the technical term for those are regroglyphs. A uh, thin section, uh, a lot of studies with meteorites uh, are done with a very thin slice of meteorite and it's analyzed via its transmission of polarized or cross-polarized light and uh, for example, uh, that's a whole subspecialty, uh, sort of analytic subspecialty of meteoritics and what you see an image there is actually a single chondrule in thin section. And shock is uh, a term that they use to indicate how much stress got applied to a specimen due to an impactor. And oftentimes times they'll show uh, uh, differences not only in thin sections but uh, within uh, um, more uh, wider studies. You can actually see uh, wide, wider view studies. You'll see veins that are uh, composed of shock created uh, minerals within the meteorites specimen. Yeah, this is a hammer is a fall and that uh, impacted a person, animal, or man-made object. And uh, this is one of the most famous ones. Um, back in 1992, uh, Michelle Knapp was sitting in her parents' living room in Peekskill, New York and she had just spent $300 to buy a 1980 Chevy Malibu. <laughs> she hears a kaboom. She goes outside and this is what she sees. That something has just uh, gone through her trunk and uh, just missed the gas tank and is sitting right in the driveway right over here. So it turns out that uh, it was a meteorite. And uh, to make a long story short, um, she more than made up for her $300 investment. <laughs> the uh, vehicle was actually sold to a consortium of uh, collectors uh, for about $10,000. <laughs> the meteorite itself was sold for even more money. And I have a small fragment of piece still here. A ruster is a meteorite, a metallic specimen, that is prone to oxidation. And my large uh, slice uh, from Sweden is a ruster because it uh, is prone to getting rust spots on it. And a meteor wrong. <laughs> have one up here as well. And uh, that's something that looks like it could be a meteorite, but in fact it isn't. And usually it's some sort of slag, but it also could be magnetite or something, uh, again, earth, earthbound, but not of extraterrestrial origin. How do we get meteorites? Well, usually starts off where nomadic peoples, uh, now they know there's a big market for these things, they look for anomalous stones in the desert. Then specimens get sold to middlemen in a marketplace, maybe one or more levels of the middlemen, <coughs> and eventually they get sold to dealer collectors. Um, and sometimes that happens uh, Locally, sometimes that happens in some of the big shows. And uh, the big U.S. show, which is in Tucson, Arizona, uh, is uh, 
uh, just ended, I think maybe uh, either last week or today. And so a lot of uh, meteorites changed hands during those meetings. Processing, if, you, if it's thought to be a uncommon or new specimen, then the main mass owner will uh, send a sample to a lab for analysis and classification, and then submit the results to the official body, which is the Nomenclature Committee of the Meteoritical Society, for approval and naming. And depending on the value, the owner may slice and dice this specimen for sale. So, let's talk about value. And of course, like anything else, the value of any particular specimen is based on supply and demand. And meteorite specimens are usually priced per gram. And so you'll find uh, meteorite collectors will have a gram scale, usually to at least accuracy of a tenth of a gram. Now, uh, these values are rough price ranges, and these are just my estimates, so your mm -hmm. estimates may vary. But there are inexpensive, which is less than $20 a gram, and those are some of the names you might find. Northwest Africa, NWA 869, Campo del Cielo, Canyon Diablo, or an unclassified stone. Intermediate, $20 to $100 per gram, uh, such as Esquel Allende or Chelyabinsk. Then you have the expenses, and those are like $100 to $1,000 per gram. And those are like your Martian Shurgatites, historical fa falls, and some lunar. I even have one more, which I call astronomical. <laughs> <laughs> and that's over $1,000 a gram. And then you're talking about knock lights, Chesig nights, something like Tagish Lake, uh, Ensisheim, and many lunars are like that. So, desirable attributes. Weight. And one way that you can accumulate a decent collection is by keeping the specimen sizes small, so low weights uh, uh, can give you a lot of uh, leeway to acquire more, more specimens. Uh, I find about the minimum weight to have at least something that's uh, decent to look at is probably about three-tenths of a gram. Okay, beauty, like palisite slices. Historical, those are desirable. Crusted meteorites are more valuable than non-crusted ones in general. Oriented, which is even a rarer form, are even more valuable. And if they are specialties, some people just collect hammers, some people collect witness falls, uh, some people uh, collect um, from a specific uh, rare location. And other rare uh, um, types like Martian and lunar planetary uh, meteorites. But very desirable specimens are labeled museum quality. Now there are some things that aren't meteorites but are related to them. Things like tectites. And those are glassy terrestrial debris from a meteorite impact. Got a couple of those up here. Impact types, earth rock that's created or modified by a meteorite, meteoritic impact. And I've got one of those pieces up here. This is from Germany. And this is a, a type of uh, rock called suavite. And natural glass, and what I'm calling natural glass in this context is a uh, melt product resulting from an airburst of meteoritic explosion, and such as this Libyan desert glass, and impact sediment, 
And what I have here is a uh, sedimentary rock containing evidence of meteoritic impact. And I do have a uh, specimen of uh, Rubio, which is the uh, KT boundary sediment that uh, was used to make the case for a meteorite impact having to do with the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs. And uh, tektites come in all forms and shapes, and this is a sort of diagram to show how those shapes uh, get formed depending on how close that the uh, debris fell from the impact site. Acquiring meteorites. Well, you can do meteorite hunting, uh, but you have to keep uh, some things in mind if you do. And for starters, you better have permission to hunt wherever it is you're hunting. Uh, you have to have the right sort of equipment, like magnets on a stick, metal detectors perhaps. You have to know what are common stones for the area and what then be able to recognize what an anomalous stone or a meteorite might look like. You have to be aware of things that could pose like meteorites or meteorons. And uh, you have to be aware of local ownership laws. So just because you find something somewhere doesn't mean that you necessarily own it. And then you also have to be concerned in some cases about transport and export regulations. And this shows you where most meteorites are found. Believe it or not, most of them are found in Antarctica. But uh, many are found in, in northern Africa, Oman, North America, and in everywhere else amounts to about 6%. Is gem, mineral, and fossil shows, such as the Northern Virginia show, which happens uh, here. Uh, Last two years, it's been in November here at George Mason University. Also, you can buy them off the internet. I wouldn't recommend to start that way, uh, but again, if you uh, know what you're doing and know what you're looking for, um, that can be a good way to go, eBay more than Amazon. But in any case, uh, you might want to look for that seal, uh, International Meteorite Collectors Association. That's kind of like the good housekeeping seal of the meteorite business. Uh, and that, uh, uh, that sort of guarantees that uh, if, you have, if you get something that really turns out not to be authentic, there's some, an organization that you can go to. So, collecting meteorites, you want to be concerned about storage and display. So, there are various ways of displaying them, like caliper stands, kind of pricey, but they're good for large specimens. You have Riker mounts, those are these boxes, good for a lot of uh, different types of specimens. And for smaller ones, you have membrane boxes, where there are boxes where the specimen is sandwiched in between a couple of uh, very thin plastic layers. So you can actually see the entire specimen, and at the same time, uh, not worry about it uh, getting fingerprints or crumbling away on you. Labeling is critical. Because uh, a lot of your samples will start to look like others of your specimens. And the last thing you want to do is to start confusing specimens. So it's very critical to label things carefully and to keep things well labeled. And also to keep records of where you uh, purchased it, how much you paid, and all the other records for uh, size and category of the uh, specimen. Uh, I use a uh, freeware collection uh, database system called Datacro, which I have modified to uh, um, catalog my collection. And it works pretty well. Care and maintenance. 
oxygen and moisture are things that the, these things definitely don't like. And so humidity control and rust treatment are things that uh, you may have to get involved in. Uh, there are some good guidance on the, online on some of the uh, dealer meteorite sites on how to uh, best preserve and work with uh, um, bits of rust on your specimens. And friable specimens, which are specimens that are crumbly, such as Tagish Lake. And those, again, require uh, very special handling. In some cases, uh, it's worth getting a nice pair of white gloves to do the white glove treatment. Now, the various types of collections are collection categories. Um, there are some people who like to try and be a type collector, have one of every type. Good luck with that. <laughs> some are pretty rare, uh, you get into a lot of money. But uh, one of the other things is that also, uh, as time goes on and further studies come in, sometimes the types of meteorites can change. So you have to keep up with that as well. You can collect historical falls, such as the uh, Sakota Lean, or Ensisheim, or Weston, or any of those guys. So uh, that's a one, another specialty. Witness falls, that's another specialty. Hammers, for people that like collect hammers. Thin sections. Oh, by the way, uh, that photo that came up with the hammer over here, that is the only documented person to have been hit with a meteorite that has fallen. fallen. That was uh, um, Mrs. Hodges from Sylacauga, Alabama. Meteorite came through her home, bounced off some furniture, and gave her a nasty bruise on her side. That's another one that's a uh, piece of that are in the astronomical price range. <laughs> Geography from certain places are a way you can categorize a collection. And outreach, which is uh, kind of one of the guiding philosophies to my collection. So, meteorite outreach. Since we are a sort of outreach type of club here. It appeals to all ages, and really every meteorite tells a story. And it's a great activity when observing is impossible. And I have some of the uh, tools for that here too. Uh, one of the things I would recommend, these are some tips, use relatively large specimens that can uh, uh, tolerate rough handling. Uh, one of the things that uh, children like to do, of course, is start banging things around. And especially if they have two meteorites, they like to start banging them together. So that's one of the things to watch out for. So if you have uh, good, uh, healthy samples that can stand that sort of stuff, that's better. Otherwise, the recommendation is to use uh, uh, membrane boxes or other protective mechanisms to hold your specimen. Uh, you want to bring flashlights. You get fairly inexpensive LED flashlights here. Uh, magnets. Make these nice magnets on a stick here that you can uh, use. And a uh, magnifying lens. And I actually have magnifying lenses that have the light built in. So that's uh, all good. And believe it or not, this is an outreach activity, and that's why I intend you to come over here after the talk and to uh, look and uh, explore. Also, unlike me up here, uh, don't display more specimens than you can monitor. <laughs> and uh, you want to display basic information for all your specimens that you have. And, <coughs> Have some takeaways, like uh, cards or something that say, I touched a meteorite. And I've got things that say, I touched a meteorite at the Novak meeting. 
and you can fill in the name of the meteorite that you touched, and then you can have a uh, something that's suitable for framing it. <laughs> and finally, encourage photos of your audience mem uh, members to interact as they interact with uh, the specimens that you bring. So some frequently asked questions. These are just the questions. Uh, we'll have the, save the answer for later, perhaps. But how would someone know that a rock on the ground is a meteorite? And uh, the, the official answer is you'd probably have to send that in to a lab. Uh, and there are some uh, labs that uh, may take that uh, stuff and, and analyze it, uh, perhaps for a fee. How do they know that a meteorite is from the moon or from Mars? Well, the moon, they have samples of the moon that they can compare them with. From Mars, uh, they know that uh, some of these meteorites do contain uh, samples of Martian atmosphere that are in, <coughs> inside the meteorite, and so that they can match those up with what we know about the Martian atmosphere. And so uh, that's one of the ways of telling them. How much is that meteorite worth? That's kind of a tricky question. Again, meteorites come in ranges of prices. And one of the things that you try and avoid, because uh, we also have a meteorite uh, discovery station at the uh, National Air and Space Museum, and we really prefer uh, not to discuss uh, meteorite value, uh, simply because uh, people then uh, start to give you uh, security issues. And do, one of the questions I've gotten a number of times is, do meteorites contain any elements not found on Earth? And the short answer is no. Well, they do contain minerals or other compounds that are either rare or not found on Earth. So some points to remember. Most meteorites were originally parts of asteroids. Meteorites are found all over the world. Most meteorites are about 300 million to 500 million years older than the oldest earth rock. And meteorites contain all the chemical elements found on Earth. And some meteorites are actually blasted off the surface of Mars and our Moon. Some recommended reading. The Field Guide to Meteors and Meteorites one of those uh, Patrick Moore's Practical Astronomy series. This is an excellent book. For younger readers, there is What's So Mysterious About Meteorites. Uh, the article that, oh, an e-magazine, Meteorite Times. That's one that you can find online at meteorite-times.com. <coughs> and, uh, Beginner's Guide to Collecting Meteorites, that was actually in the um, December 2016 issue of the Reflector, which all our members should have received. That's a very good article. So now you can amaze your friends and relatives with all your knowledge. <laughs> Thank you very much.